and want to do better. And this one is a gorgeous beauty shark. I'm really excited that we managed to get the variety that we did. I think a product like this, it, it sort of reinvigorates you and it gets you excited about photography uh, in a new way. Want to accelerate. So let's take a look back at the original inspiration, which was this Turner painting. And then let's have a look at how it turned out. These, uh, originally we're going to shoot with flash, and then I changed my mind and decided to go with continuous uh, light, which is one of my favorites. Um, I guess like many photographers and filmmakers, I'm a light obsessive. I'm sure we're all the same here. You know, I, I never stop looking at light. Uh, but I found that the continuous light in this case worked extremely well. And what was the most surprising thing was the R system, and the particularly for me, the 50 millimeter lens. In fact, uh, Let's just move on. These are some of the captures. And what, what I can do here, let's have a look. Here we go. We've got a couple of results from this shoot. So let's move through them. So you can see the illusion of fire. Do you agree it's working? Yeah? And also with the addition of a little help from an app, you can add animation to these files as well. I don't do it ordinarily to pictures but I felt in this case for social media at least it added a lot uh, and the picture that was chosen by the Birmingham Royal Ballet was this one and I think they felt that this captured the essence the actual title of the production there were two titles fire and fury and ignite and you can see there the fire and the fury I think this one probably answers better the second title, Ignite, and if you want to have a look, that's, that's the file printed. Um, so this is from an EOS R with a 50 millimeter prime. It's shot in DP RAW, and then it's exported as a 16-bit TIFF file, Adobe RGB, and then printed on an Image Prograph Pro 1000, and that just took a few minutes to print at highest quality settings. And The second one is Daria. Daria is actually Romanian. Uh, she's a good friend of mine. And she's under there somewhere. Uh, but it's very much ab about that. Let me hand those out. Normally with print, if there were archival prints, we'd be wearing gloves. But for today's purposes, I just want you to, to see print, feel print. Uh, because for me at least, I don't think there's for a photographer, there's any better way of showing our work than as ink on paper. I actually believe uh, that it changes the way I shoot. You know, when I know I'm shooting to make a print, uh, I think differently. These are the finished results with uh, text. You can see Fire and Fury. You can see there was a whole myriad, and actually that middle one there, that was used by Canon extensively for the R system launch. And now you can see the, the word, the wording. And I, I particularly, the graphic designer in, anybody here who's graphic designers? All oh, right, you're a graphic designer, photographer, so okay. That's interesting to me because I think a lot of graphic designers um, really have this natural sort of, um, I don't know, grounding really in layout, um, in working with um, composition. And, and light and for me at least I had 20 years of being a graphic designer who was art directing other photographers but I lacked the confidence to shoot and it was when I actually made that transition that my life changed and uh, and then I kind of I felt really liberated by that I'm not going to get too technical with you but to make that print uh, we use Canon professional print and layout or print studio pro it's a very clever piece of software uh, kind of like the cement that glues Lightroom and Photoshop or Phase One or whatever it is that you use to the printer. And it takes all your profiles. Uh, you can make further adjustments. You can do something called a pattern print, actually, which is really interesting. Uh, let's have a look, see if we've got one. Here's one. So there's a pattern print. And what that does 
is you can actually do it with colour or you can do it with brightness and uh, it gives you lots of options so that's the, that's the actual target and then you can look at what would it be like if I lightened it or darkened it or if I changed uh, different colour settings so they're very useful, let me pass that around as well and of course what that does is it, it saves you uh, money on paper for one thing put that over there so at home I have a Pro 1000, I have a Pro 2000, I have a Pro 300 as well. And how do you do this one? Do you reckon on the printer? Sorry? How do you do this? That was made just a few moments ago right here. Yeah, so I, I exported my 16-bit TIFF file. No, no, this layout with all this... Uh, oh, right, that's called a pattern print. So we can talk about that a little bit later. Okay. Um, and it's, it's an option that Print Studio Pro gives you, uh, which... Um, which enables you to, as I explain, you know, colour or black and white and save paper. Exactly. I mean, I don't know about you, but I use Hannah Mueller paper, which, is, uh, which, which I love. Yeah. But if you have a sheet, a box of Hannah Mueller paper like that, it's many hundreds of euros. So you want to save paper. You don't want to waste yeah. paper. But also, we can soft proof too. So soft proofing meaning with a calibrated monitor. Usually for me, that's an ISO. But if, as long as you've got a calibrated monitor, uh, you're also going to save... Uh, a lot of money on paper wastage. We could get further into this by using calibrated lighting as well and controlling, creating a colour managed workflow, which of course is what I love. But I don't want to get too technical with this, but we can all talk about this later on. Um, I'm going to round up this story with the last shoot, which was earlier this year. And this was a collaboration um, uh, with a magazine. And... Uh, they asked me to guest edit, uh, which I did. Uh, and for their feature piece, uh, I worked with Carlos Acosta. Anybody work in dance? Anybody know anything about dance? Well, basically, Carlos Acosta is the director of the Birmingham Royal Ballet. He's also, um, I guess it's, 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 uh, it's a fact, he's the most famous dancer in the world, uh, Cuban, and a, a very, very interesting character. And incredible. He's, he's really, in fact, he's a legend, uh, a legendary dancer, even in his own lifetime. So it was really exciting for me and those of you who shoot portraits. I think you'll hopefully find something useful from this. Um, uh, this was my first shoot, I think, post-COVID. It was January this year. And I shot it in natural light. I did two setups, one in natural light and a second setup in continuous light. Uh, and amazingly, I got Carlos for about an hour and a half, which is unheard of, really, uh, for people like Carlos. And you can see here some of the setup, uh, just using uh, soft window light, uh, reflectors. And in this case, I'm using the Canon EOS R5. But guess what lens I'm using? 50, yeah, exactly, the 50. Although, I did have the 85DS. Anybody know about that lens? Yeah, ask the guys, that's an intro. We have two 85s, and it's got a slightly different bokeh. It's, uh, it's kind of an interesting lens. Uh, but the majority of my work is shot very wide open. Uh, so uh, it could be 1.2 down to maybe 2, 2.8 at most. But what I was looking for was to try and connect, get a connection with Carlos. Uh, this is very important to me. We... We as photographers and filmmakers can understand light, we can understand the technical, but one of the best pieces of advice I was given, which was by fashion photographer Nick Knight, was Clive, don't forget about the performance. And that's often, I think, one of the things, particularly when you're in a high pressure situation, where you can forget about that interpersonal connection that you need to make with the subject. You know, to take a deep breath, to sort of calm down inside, and then remember that it's a human being that's in front of you and you're trying to put them at ease and by doing that in turn actually you put yourself at ease too but of course with celebrities sometimes I was talking to another photographer who I was working with a couple of weeks ago um, and he, he had two minutes to shoot a portrait with a famous uh, British politician two minutes is probably longer than I would have wanted to spend quite frankly with that politician but he made the most incredible picture uh, in just two minutes. So being able to walk into a situation and being able to look at the light, look at the composition, look at the location, and then take that picture is a great, great skill. 
but you only get that skill by earning it. You know, it takes years and years and years to accumulate that skill, that I'm sure all of you here uh, know. Here's the continuous side of this shoot. So you see I love lanterns. I love lantern light. I mean, we use it in filmmaking as well. And I love shape tools for the lights as well. <coughs> and I, at this point, I wanted to get in close and get that connection with Carlos. But he really lit up the lens. You know, he lit up the frame. Uh, from the very first moment that I started to shoot the picture, he went into this pose, which I love. He almost looks like a bullfighter. Uh, and again, here, just these incredible poses that you could never, ever imagine somebody doing. Really dramatic, really incredible performance. But then when I asked him to internalize, he gave me these much more considered um, pictures, which I find when I'm, and I'm very lucky that I get to work in rehearsals with Birmingham Royal Ballet, and I get this close to dancers. And one of the things we don't realize when we watch ballet is that the dancers are performing. You know, they're great actors uh, as well as dancers. And I remember in Romeo and Juliet, for example, a couple of years ago, I was w this distance from the performance. And it literally makes you very emotional, you know, when you're that close uh, to that level of dedication and expertise. You know, it's, it's really quite a privilege, actually. And that's why I love sharing these stories, because I'm very privileged to be able to do this. And I'm sure you've all got stories, too where you're very privileged and it's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to come here and share these stories. Uh, I think we're going to print that one in a little while if we're not already printed it. Uh, that's kind of an interesting one because it's, uh, it's a great uh, picture for black and white. Uh, uh, this is my setup at home and as you can see this is the Image Prograph Pro 300 which is kind of a it's a, it's a full image prograph archival printer and uh, it's got the smallest footprint of any of the printers. So it's a good starting point for anybody who wants to get into archival printmaking. So if you're making prints, you know, if you shoot in weddings and you want to sell prints, this could be a good starting point. And it's actually, uh, this and the 1000 uh, get used a lot and then uh, the 2000 is the bigger 24-inch. Uh, uh, if you want to read more about that story, I don't know if you want to use your phone or whatever, uh, there is a story on the Canon Pro print, print page, um, or, or the guys will put this up later on, um, and you can read all about this. Anybody got any questions at this point? Any thoughts? Quite happy to have a chat, you know, at this point. I'll keep going and we can talk later on. One thing I should say about my work, all of these projects actually, they're all passion projects. And how many people here are shooting passion projects right now? Put your hands up. Only one? There must be more. Vlad's doing passion projects. Okay. The passion project, I was talking about this over lunch today. For me, the passion project is really important because my biggest commission work has come from passion projects. So ad agencies, clients see your passion project and then they think, oh, that fits my brand. I really like that. And that happened with this project. And uh, my agent got a phone call from Paris after I'd been shooting in Scotland for a few days, no, for a few weeks. And they said, we really love Clive's work. And then they commissioned me to shoot, it was Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy, and they commissioned me for four years to shoot their campaign work for a whiskey brand called Ardbeg, which was a dream project for me because I got to go and spend time on a remote Scottish island uh, for three, four weeks every year. And that enabled me to do another passion project, which was this one, which is the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. This is really important to me because I have a fascination with people who volunteer. It, it's, it in, I find it incredible and really moving that people would actually selflessly give up their time and actually put themselves at great risk to save the lives of a complete stranger. And I wonder what it is that makes people do that. And I wanted to find out more. My work in Scotland which was about the people of a Scottish island, 
led me to look at in a bit more detail uh, into this project. And this began back in, gosh, what was, would it be, 2013, 14? And it just coincided that at the time, um, maybe a bit later, 5DS and 5DSR uh, came out. And this was great because this project was a project to make prints because at, the, at this point, uh, Canon had also got excited about this project and thought, we can use this work um, for our image prographs and we can actually make uh, fine art prints of landscapes in Scotland, of portraits in Scotland, seascapes. And of course, what better camera to use than a big megapixel camera like the 5DS, the 5DS. So anybody use these cameras? Nobody used these cameras. So this was a 45 megapixel camera. Um, and at the time, this was a, a, you know, it was a big deal. Uh, you combine that with a Canon printer, and there's shared technology between the two. It's worth mentioning at this point that Canon is the only brand that make cameras and printers. And I think that's important because the input-output story, it's pulled together. And there's shared technologies, the software works between the two, and the technical guys can tell you a lot more about this than I can. But this project was actually um, used to promote the Pro 1000. So when the Pro 1000 came out, this project was used to do that. Well, let's go back to uh, what it is that I was doing. So what had happened is they only had uh, one of these cameras in Europe, I think, and which came to me in the UK. Uh, and maybe there was two, two or three more. Uh, they're all under embargo, and they said, Clive, if you use this, you've got to be really careful with it. Don't take it near water. Don't take it near dust. So I took it out to sea, and I thought I'll use it for this. Um, anyway, at this point, uh, I'm looking at the uh, lifeboat, and I'm thinking that all that water's got to go somewhere, and of course that's going to go onto the camera. Um, there's an interesting story behind this picture because I actually missed the shot. <laughs> so I was shooting with a, a 70 to 200. I really should have had a 24 to 70. So the shot had gone. And which is a great shame because that's a 42 ton lifeboat literally in the air flying past you. Uh, but of course, you don't dwell on it. That's one of the things I learned early on because we all make mistakes in whatever we do. And when you make a mistake, it's very easy to let it eat you up inside. And you can do that so much and, and you can actually build this huge amount of anxiety from that that it can actually really make you falter again and again and again and then it this is interesting because this was with the 70 to 200 and i put it on servo and the wave came into the frame and the focus went from the boat to the wave which i thought was interesting because what that did it gave uh, a different POV or point of view. So look at that again. And this is something I then, because I'd made that mistake, and often this happens, you know, you make a mistake, oh, I like that. Um, and I actually started to develop this idea. And uh, I started to keep working this idea of creating this POV of the survivor or the person who is going to be rescued by the lifeboat. Of course, having a crew and a team of volunteers who are prepared to, to have you along when they do an exercise, which they do every week, sometimes in quite big seas, as you can see, uh, is very useful. Uh, we're on a small, relatively small, rigid inflatable boat. It's, uh, it's a moving platform. Um, it's not everybody's cup of tea because a lot of people, even in fact in the lifeboat, people are being sick, they're being ill. So this isn't always pleasant. And I always have to have a safety officer, so there's somebody who's holding on to me to make sure I'm safe. 
And then the person at the helm of the lifeboat is actually the lifeboat operations manager who's responsible for that uh, area, for that crew. Huge amount of expertise. Local fishermen involved. The crews are all local. So there's a huge amount of knowledge, huge amount of expertise. And safety is number one, always, when we're working at sea like this. But once you've prepared for these shots, uh, it's amazing what you can achieve. Here's another one with that point of view. So bearing in mind, I'm thinking about being the survivor, being somebody who is maybe, um, it could be a fishing boat that's had a fire or sunk. Someone might have gone overboard from a, I don't know, a cruise ship or a yacht. Somebody might be washed out to sea and fold uh, around you, which is kind of lucky, you know, when you get the waves moving a certain way. It's a little bit like going back to the ballet because you've got the movement of the waves, you've got the movement of the boat that you're shooting, and then you've got the movement of the boat that you're on. So it's all changing all the time. More recently, uh, my uh, manager got, uh, agent got a call uh, from an, uh, a design consultancy uh, in London saying, we've seen this picture and we really like it and we want to use it on a potato chips packaging. And uh, I thought, fine, you know, no problem. And this is what, uh, this is what uh, came from that. You know, when you're shooting your pictures, you never know quite where they're going to be. When I was taking that picture, I didn't think for a minute it was going to appear on a, on a crisp packet. But a percentage of the proceeds from uh, that snack go to the lifeboat. So that then becomes very, very important. And that's kind of a privilege to be involved in that. But just like with 5DS and 5DSR, when... 5D Mark IV came out, Canon once again gave me uh, the bodies and I combined this, in this case I think I got 85 and, I can't read that, but 35, 35 and 85 have I got there, yeah. So I'm working on two primes for that. Um, and they said, once again, be careful with it, don't get it wet. So this is... Uh, Winter 2018, 50 mile per hour winds, it's snowing and it's minus five. So, once again, this isn't everybody's sort of cup of tea, as we might say in the UK, but for me, this is, I am in my element when I'm doing this, in the elements. I love doing the studio work, I love working with, I particularly love working with ballet, but for me, this is my ultimate sort of uh, relaxation, shall we say, and uh, I find nothing more rewarding than working with the volunteers, uh, because being part of that crew and working with that crew uh, is incredible. It's such an amazing privilege to, to work with them and to tell their story. As you can see, that POV again, you know, I'm putting the focus on the wave, not on the boat. And also using the location. Often we plan several days in advance of these shoots. So they're planned just as much as we might plan a studio shoot. We look for wind against tide. We look for uh, a sky that has got broken clouds, so we might get sunshine. But look at the drama and the atmosphere. This is just a, a, a friend of mine just recorded this from their smartphone. But look at the drama and the atmosphere, even from the smartphone. I mean, what an incredible place to be. And then these are the results from that day. This is what that, uh, that day gave me. Although I'm the person taking the picture, these are big team events, big, big, big collaborations. Because the person who's at the helm of the boat is putting me in the right position, which is difficult. You know, they're going to put me uh, stern on, 
and they're going to move. There's radio comms going on between my boat and the lifeboat. The helm on the lifeboat is actually working out the position. The tide's moving, the wind's moving. It's a complex operation. And then you've got to think about the weather as well. But just occasionally you'll get a break like that one. Where you can see the, the water has created that incredible shape. And then in the background, of course, you've got the location, which is really important. So it's putting the lifeboat in a location. This one, I think, is a really important picture because most normal people would be going to the right out of the storm. But of course, the guys, the volunteers, are going into the storm. They're going somewhere where most normal people would not want to go. Because at the other end of that is somebody who's in real trouble and might die if these guys don't go out to find them. So these days when I'm uh, shooting this, uh, it would be with the R5. Anybody here shoot with R5? No? R6? R6, yeah. Again, R6 I could shoot with. Um, pretty much any of the R series. And there are, there are certain uh, benefits which you guys know uh, through mirrorless. This being one of the big ones. Um, I don't shoot manual. I shoot aperture priority. My attitude to photography is if the cam I let the camera do a lot of the technical work. And with Canon mirrorless now, um, we've got very sophisticated electronic viewfinders. That's really important. That's the first thing because I'm seeing what I'm going to shoot. So I'm seeing my exposure. I'm seeing if there's color shifts. Uh, I'm seeing whether it's sharp or not. But also we have these incredible deep learning algorithms. So if I'm shooting portraits at 1.2, uh, a box is drawn around the face and then over the eye. And guess what? I can even move the box between the eyes, which is uh, an incredible thing. If you were shooting animals, uh, it will put a box around the head and then the eye. And if it was a lifeboat or a car or a vehicle or even an airplane, uh, the camera will work out and then help the focus of that. I found this to be incredibly valuable. And of course, since that first shoot in 2018, the lenses and the cameras have grown. Of course, so now we've got R7. Um, anybody got the R7? I think we, have, we think we may have some here that you can try. Um, and I now have, uh, as well as my 50 mil, I have a 100, 500, 70 to 200, 24 to 70, 24, 105, 85. And I love using them all. And my newest one will be hopefully the, um, the dual fisheye for VR. Anybody seen that? Canon's first virtual reality lens. Super, super clever thing. So for shoots now, um, uh, that. But people can't even be bothered to go from that to that, so now we've got to shoot that. And then, we're doing good for time. This is, uh, just gives you a little bit of a clue of the equipment I use uh, at sea. So I use a think tank case. I don't know if anybody uses those. They're really cool. Um, but also, if I go in the water, which sometimes I do, I, uh, you can buy these small, fully uh, waterproof cases for G7X or G5X Mark II, and I love those cameras. This project grew, and um, I was lucky enough to be invited to work with the Royal Navy and the RNLI on one of the last ever exercises before... Uh, the um, Coast Guard uh, was privatized. And that meant being winched into the helicopter. So what I thought I'd do is I'd shoot that. They allowed me to use one camera and one lens. So I used a, a very wide zoom. And uh, you have a strop which goes under your arms. The reason for only having one camera, you have to, you have to keep your hands by your side. Because you winched off the boat very quickly, and then the next minute you're sort of 90 feet in the air. So you've got to keep your hands by the side, and you keep the camera down by your side. Um, and they gave me special permission to sort of dangle my feet over the side. 
I used a G7X to film it all, and this is uh, the result. So I'll kind of take you behind the scenes uh, from the lifeboat into the helicopter. I like to give myself an objective in whatever sheet it might be, and in that case, it was to get that picture of the lifeboat going underneath the helicopter and having the shadow of the helicopter over the top of the lifeboat because a Sea King helicopter's got a very particular shape. And so I worked with the flight lieutenant and with the coxswain and the lifeboat operations manager and the whole team. We had a, a briefing session, and basically what needed to happen was the helicopter had to be exactly between the sun and the boat. And, uh, and for that to happen was, was technically a little bit of a challenge. So the helicopter has to hover into wind. You have to be so many degrees off to the uh, starboard. And anyway, when we got over all those things, this sort of ballet again, and this time it was helicopter, lifeboat, and water happened. And then we were, we were able to shoot that picture which I was really proud of because we only really had one go at it. And, uh, and it, again, a huge team effort. But of course, the boats, the helicopters, all this uh, technological hardware is just one aspect. What's really behind all of this are the volunteers themselves, and that's where portraiture comes into play. And so I wanted to tell the stories of the volunteers themselves. That was really, really important to me. These people have become my very close friends. Um, and I think that bond that you build when you're out at sea with them, when you're working together, uh, you know, you can't, it's such a human thing. It's just wonderful and it's such a privilege. And so whenever I take their picture, it, it, there's so much resting on the pressing of that button. You know, we live in a world now where uh, it's more than a trillion. It's probably two. It may be even five trillion pictures taken every year on these. Don't get me wrong. You know, these take great pictures. I take great pieces of my cat with mine. Um, but I could take better. But for me, when you've got a big camera, you look through the viewfinder. I'm cutting out the rest of the world. Um, it's, it's a story, it's a, a tool for telling stories. So it's an enabler. I'm not, if I'm honest, I'm not that bothered about the look of a camera. I don't get too precious about the camera. It's just an enabler for me to tell a story. And I happen to work with Canon because I believe in the product. I believe in it so much. Um, if I'm making a film, I've got a, I've got a product. You know, I've got many products. If I'm shooting stills, I've got many product, products. If I'm making prints, I've got the choice of all of these printers. But I think the point I'm trying to make here is the importance of when you press that button, everything that goes into the pressing of that button, you know, the time before you press that button, and the connection you make with that person is so important, you know, that there are tiny, tiny things happening in the human face. You know, our expressions can change. I could shoot, and I'm sure everybody here has done the same thing, I could shoot 50, pic 50 pictures of the same person. There's only one picture that I would use. You know, because there's some nuance, something tiny in their expression that makes that picture better than the other 49. And the reason that is, is because we're making that connection with that person. And that's a really important point. So I wanted to tell the stories of people like David. And to do that, I needed to spend more time with them. Time with them, time with them on the boat. Show some narrative pictures as well, so I can build these narratives. Another David, uh, a mechanic, 
This is between the mighty MTU engines, these huge engines that power this 42-ton lifeboat. And in this one, I gave David the brief, I said, think Popeye. So in his head, I planted the idea of Popeye. And he's got these huge forearms, you know, he's a big, strong guy. But you can see almost, can't you, the way he grips the rail, you can see his flexing his forearms. And the strength that is in him, the bars around him, the engines, everything about that feels like strength. And he, he owns that space. And he needs to own that space because he's the mechanic. He's responsible for those engines. So he's a really key ingredient to that crew on that boat. That was the available light? Sorry? The available no. Uh, it, that was very, very simple. There were two lights. There was the actual lighting inside the lifeboat itself. And then I had a one-by-one one LED light panel. And I use foldable light panels. I don't know if you've seen them. Made by a company called Fomex. And you can literally fold them into spaces. And they're waterproof. So they're perfect for this kind of stuff. And I actually use modeling tools on those, shaping tools on those lights, like soft boxes and uh, grids and uh, lanterns as well. Uh, but predominantly, uh, a lot of the work is available light. This is just after uh, an exercise where they're actually, um, it's man overboard exercise from the little, they have something called a Y boat. It's a small, rigid, inflatable boat on the back of the seven class lifeboat, which they can go inshore with it and pull people from inshore. And they were doing a, a man overboard test or actually pulling somebody out of the water. So they're having to, they're in immersion seats, they're being dunked in the water. And of course, it gives you that sort of lovely feel and look. What I decided to do was I wanted to photograph the crew. So I photographed the entire crew all in window light, in the same light. So no one was indistinguishable lighting wise from the other. And then I built on that by following individuals into their day to day lives. In this case, Ronald Fletcher, Rondi, um, hundreds of sheep. So I went out on the quad bike with him um, and got to better understand his world and his dogs weren't too chuffed I think but they still make great pictures and then I photographed Rondi in his day-to-day -day wardrobe and you can see here there's a narrative so you can see the tractor in the background you can see the sheepdog you can see what he's wearing and then I gradually dissolve that into his crew kit. <coughs> you can see I've also taken some of the colour out of that because it's quite distracting. But here's the thing, right? Some of these people, uh, second, third, or even fourth generation um, volunteers, I find that fascinating. So here's Ronald's son, Paddy. He's also a coxswain of the lifeboat, and he also uh, works on the land as well. And again, I photographed him in similar light. So then I created this idea of diptych portraits. So I was creating this narrative from these portraits. And then again, I would go out in the boot boat and shoot around these individuals to build a narrative again. But when you think about volunteers and you think about what they leave behind, this is when it becomes really, really emotive. Because when Ronald and Paddy go out to sea, they're leaving their families behind. In this case, Ruth and Harvey. And here's three potential generations of volunteers. There's a growing number of women in the RNLI. I think it's 12% and rising now. And that's a subject that I want to cover. In fact, I've shot new work this year, which I've not shared yet, of, um, of women volunteers. This is Cara. Cara is, I think, I think she's second or third generation volunteer. And this is Cara at work, and then Cara in a crew kit. Here's Stevie. And I wanted these pictures to be real. You know, I don't, I don't dress people. I don't make them wear things that they wouldn't normally wear. 
I want it to be honest. I want it to be authentic, and I want it to be genuine. These are words now that we see out there all the time, aren't we? Don't we? We see the words genuine, authentic next to brands and next to products. If you're having to say that something is genuine and authentic, it sort of makes it it's odd to me because if something is genuine and authentic, it will speak for itself. So at the end of this project, or certainly at the, the, we reached a point with Pro 1000 where Canon wanted me to do a studio shoot, and I said, no, no, I've got this much better idea. I'm working on this project in Scotland. So they came up to Scotland and made a launch film for this project, the Pro 1000, which I had under uh, embargo at my home for a few months. And they made this launch film. But then we recut that film. And we made another film for the Royal National Lifeboat Institution to help with their volunteer week. So to get people interested about volunteering. And this is the film that was made. I should say before I show this, that this is a print story. So this is about passion for print. This is capture to print. So what was the best way for me to thank these people, but to take their picture make prints and then make an exhibition and then give them the prints and so that's what this story is about the core of my elix project is really in the title elix being people of isla and what i loved was the liberation to combine two great loves isla and photography Initially, at least, I wanted to focus on my work with Isla r and You know, I have a tremendous respect for the crew of the lifeboat because they do literally put their lives on the line for complete strangers. The majority of the people on that boat are volunteers. They are such a tight unit, absolutely at the top of their game. Although it's a 42-ton boat, it moves with great speed and grace. There is a feeling of majesty about it. It comes back to that tingle down your spine because you know that this boat is representative of this incredible organization. You do get this feeling of being very, very safe, both in their hands, but also because of the design of the boat. You know, it's a complex piece of engineering. And, uh, they play it like a piano. And then I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to photograph those same people, but in their everyday lives? And to really illustrate that these are ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Your respect for these people just grows and grows. The more you get to know them and the more time you spend with them and their families, you just realize exactly what's at stake for these people. I felt this deep connection with both the people of Isla and the place. It's been one of the most incredible experiences of my life. It's such an incredible subject. I know that on the island, everyone has an involvement, whether small or large, with the RLI. And so it's very important that this project gives something back to the people of Isla. And what better way than to put on an exhibition? Each printer's got my DNA stamped right inside it from the capture, the post-production, and the print itself. Putting on the exhibition was uh, a uniquely special experience for me. The reactions were beyond any of my expectations. It's incredibly special, and something I'll never, ever forget. I came across a quote which I felt summed up the crew of the Iron Alliance. Courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the judgment that something else is more important than fear. So as you can see, print 
is in circumstances like this, there, I, I honestly believe there's no better gift you can give to people. And often when I photograph people, and I'm sure those of you who shoot weddings um, know that print is a very, very important part of that. But when I shoot portraits of people, I think the, the best gift I can give them is to make them a print myself, a fine art archival print, and give them that. If you want to know more about that project, if you want to take a picture of that, there's a whole backstory to that, including that film and interviews. And once again, you know, also if you just uh, um, look up Clive Booth Photo on Instagram, do get in touch, do ask questions, uh, and I will answer you. Uh, I'm always interested to hear what people have got to say. So that brings me to my last story, um, which... Um, for me, it's a really emotive subject. It's a, it, it's, I w I'm old enough to have been born uh, at a time. We might need to turn the, the volume down a bit on this one. OK, Stefan, if you're all right. Um, I was lucky enough to be born at a time when rockets were being sent to the moon. I was just. Uh, what I was be five years old when these rockets were going to the moon. And my dad, do you, can you just turn it down a tiny bit, Stefan? Can you just turn it down a tiny bit? That's fine. That's great. My dad would get me up in the middle of the night to watch these rockets go into the moon. We were quite poor. Uh, we had, like many people back then, we had no central heating. I think we had one hot water tap. We had no bathroom. Uh, we had a toilet outside, um, no telephone, little black and white TV set, and we had one gas fire. And I would sit in my nylon pajamas uh, at 4 a.m. in the morning or 11 o'clock at night, and my dad would have dragged me out of bed and sat me in front of the TV because, of course, what he knew was that by doing that, by watching these rockets go to the moon, it would actually trigger something within me. And that did, and it's never, it's never left me. It stayed with me all my, all my entire life. Because if human beings can put somebody on the moon, we can do just about anything. And that stayed with me, that feeling of that anything's possible. And, uh, and even to this day, you know, I, the things happen, and I think, no, no, go for it, try it. Because what's the worst? Somebody can say no. Putting ourselves outside our comfort zone is so important. And taking chances, taking risks. And of course, that's what this was all about. And in fact, uh, I did some digging uh, just over the weekend. And this is my scrapbook from back then. And my dad made this for me. This is from 1971. And this was Apollo 15. And here you can see the astronaut, the command module pilot, Alfred Warden. Roll the clock forward 50 years. Bear in mind all that history, all that time that I sat with my dad, the bond I had with my dad, how that changed me as a young person. All I ever did was draw pictures of rockets. That was all I did as a kid, all the time. I could tell you the distance to the moon. I could tell you the stage of a Saturn V rocket. I could tell you so many things back then. 50 years forward, and I'm given the opportunity to meet one of the astronauts who sat on top of one of those rockets. Can you imagine what that felt like for me? This was, it was immense, it was huge. And at the time, this is uh, three years ago, I'd broken my ankle. I just had it pinned in four places, no, five, six places, four inch plate. Uh, I was recovering from it, it was six weeks in. And my friend called and said, Alfred Warden is going to be at an exhibition in London, and you can meet him. And so my wife took the day off, because she knew how important this would be to me. So there I am with crutches um, and a, a, a pot on my leg, and I take my EOS R, I take my 50 millimeter lens, and I take one one by one light panel with a softbox, and one deflector. Does anybody use deflectors? Very cool bits of kit. On one side, they've got reflective strips, 
and on the other side they're a diffuser. So the one thing can be a reflector or a diffuser. And this all fits in a small bag. So it's easy to carry. So we get there and I'm faced with Al sitting under fluorescent light. Like this. In fact, let me get to here. Like that. Now that isn't exactly complementary light, is it? So I'm not going to really be able to shoot Al in a way that is going to fulfill my childhood dream of meeting this man and probably only ever going to get this one chance of shooting his picture. So I look around me, and this is a really important story, and I share this with young people in schools because this is about really seizing that moment, grabbing that opportunity. I look around me and I think, what am I going to do? And right next door was a planetarium tent. Does anybody know what a planetarium tent is? Yeah, it's this big dome tent, and in the middle of it is a projector that's projecting the night sky. And I suddenly think, it's a blackout studio. It's not a planetarium tent. It's a blackout studio. That means if I can get Al inside the planetarium tent, my wife's going to be my lighting assistant, and we can, I can then control the light. So I run across to the guy who's, well, I didn't run. I hobbled <laughs> across to the guy who's running the tent. And I said, look, can I borrow your tent to take a picture? And he looked at me and said, he didn't understand. So, of course, then I've got to make him make the paradigm shift. I said, over there is a man who orbited the moon 75 times in 1971. He's an Apollo astronaut. I'm only going to ever get a chance to photograph him today, this once, probably. And he said, sure, come over. And he said, he, but the only problem is you've got 15 minutes to take the picture because it's when the projector cools down, there's a big queue and... So I went over to Al, uh, and he's, by the, this point, Al is 87, still very energetic, and witty, charming, funny, amazing, amazing personality. The kind of, you know, when you meet your hero, sometimes you hear people say it was a disappointment. He exceeded all my childhood expectations of what, it, he was wearing a Hawaiian shirt. You know, he's drinking cranberry and vodka. He's so cool. And um, he said, sure, no problem. So, so we went over, and I managed to sit him on a stool. My wife became my lighting assistant. My wife's only five feet tall, so that was a challenge, because she had to get the light up quite high. But, of course, by controlling the light, I went from sort of this to this. And I'm able to then use my three-dimensional lighting, my Curascoro, uh, you know, Rembrandt, Vermeer, Caravaggio, um, the Rembrandt triangle, all of that stuff. And I gave myself these mini briefs throughout. This one was Steely-Eyed Missile Man, if anybody watched Apollo 13. Uh, the people in Mission Control used to have this term, Steely-Eyed Missile Man. And so I always give myself a kind of a brief, and I actually gave that brief to Al. Um, and he's got these steely eyes. This guy's legendary. I mean, absolutely legendary, legendary man. Um, and if I'm also photographing somebody who I look up to, I literally photograph them by looking up at them. So I'll take a low angle, and by doing that, I can give this impression that I'm looking up to somebody and they're important. And then going back to my days as a designer, I start to use space and I put, as you might know, if this was for a publication, you've got loads of room to put really interesting copy. So I'm building narrative, a narrative with the uh, pictures. But that wasn't enough for me. And I thought, I want to create a single image narrative. Now, photojournalists are brilliant at doing this. And, I know, and I've seen them do it and it's so interesting. I wanted to tell a story in just one picture. So, any idea what a prop you might give an astronaut? What kind of thing could you put in an astronaut's hand, you know, to take a picture, to create the single image narrative? I mean, it could be, for example, a helmet, a space helmet, something like that. Instagram, my Instagram feed, two days before, it came up with these little moon globes. You know, you've seen them? Um, it's like 3D printed and they've got a LED inside them. And I thought, wouldn't that be cool? If I got one of those moon globes, 
So I ordered it on Amazon. It arrived literally the day before we went to London. And I thought, if I put that in his hand, then he'll be looking at the moon, which he orbited 75 times in 1971 on one of the most technologically um, demanding uh, uh, missions uh, to the moon, Apollo 15. And also, Al holds the world record, I think, to this day of being the most remote human being because Jim Irwin and Dave Scott were at one side of the moon, he's at the other, and then the rest of humanity is over there, um, which is quite incredible when you think about it. So, so I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could do that? And this was the result. So it's not, it's not a complicated picture, really. And in fact, when I took the picture, I ruled it out almost straight away. I saw it in the frame, and I thought it doesn't work. And I took maybe two or three frames. Because I only had 15 minutes, so no, no, on to the next one. And I took a bigger one, and I had him hold that, and that didn't work. And I pretty much ruled it out and thought, no, this isn't going to work. And this was one of those unusual uh, situations where when I got home and I got it into Lightroom, I started to look at the picture and I thought, actually, it does work. And uh, I loved the wistful look on his face. But you know what's important, and it, it comes back to what we were saying earlier, is the connection that you make with your subject. Because you're looking at the performance they're going to give you. And I had very little time. I mean, at this point, I've only really just met Al. I've had about 15 minutes with him. But there's already uh, a certain degree of connection. But afterwards, we got time to have lunch together. And then he actually, amazingly, got his book and signed it for me, and then I recorded this uh, to camera. Because he's been such a good guy, taking lots and lots of pictures, and I'm anxiously seeing how they turn out. Oh, there's no pressure there. So who's your favorite photographer then? Uh, oh. <laughs> this guy right next to me. <laughs> so of course I'm going to be his favorite photographer, and I'm the one sitting next to him. The interesting thing about uh, Al is that his job, one of his big roles on Apollo 15, um, was actually to uh, shoot pictures. Um, so he had to climb out of the command module. Uh, they depressurized it. He climbed out between the Earth and the Moon, crawl across uh, the service module, and then undo a compartment, take out the film, and then get back in again. And over lunch, I, and I, he must have been asked this question 100 million times before, I said, what was the most incredible thing you experienced? And without a moment's hesitation, he said, I went to extract the film from the uh, service module, and I had a moment to stop and think. And I was, hanging, I was sort of hanging there, and to my left was uh, the moon, and to my right was the earth. And I thought, I'm sitting with a human being who is actually... You know, the, Earth's what, uh, the Earth and the Moon, 240,000 miles apart, thereabouts. You know, he's in the middle of that. And he has actually seen the Earth, uh, or the Moon and the Earth like that. And I found that quite extraordinary. And, of course, like many of us, um, I could be better at this, and I'm trying to work on that, but I post the story on social media. So I post it first on Twitter. Uh, I then post it on Instagram. And I post it on LinkedIn. And interestingly, on LinkedIn, uh, I got a reply from Al's son-in-law. I don't know if you can read that, but he basically said, uh, the one of the globe is one of ours, and this is his son-in-law, but more importantly to me, not to take anything away from his son-in-law, but his daughter's favorite pictures of her father. It captured Al in all his introspection. And this is something that you can't buy. This isn't about earning money. It's not about making money. This is about the, the passion, you know, the passion that we have to actually push ourselves to get out there to do new things. What I then did was make a set of prints and sent them to America. I sent them to Houston. And in the middle of all this, I got the sad news that Al had died. And it came as a big shock, even though he was 87, because he was still very energetic. And it turned out that my picture was probably one of the last professional pictures ever taken of him. 
And this is why I come back to that point of, you know, I didn't take him under this light. I ran across to the guy who'd got the planetarium tent. I managed to get Al into the tent. Had the broken ankle, still got there. My wife took the day off. You know, we did all that stuff. Sent the pictures to Houston. And they sent me a message back. And they said, this is our living room wall. These are all the pictures that we've got of Dad. And these are all the time that he was the head of Edwards Air Force Base, his time at NASA. His pictures, his pictures of the moon that he shot. What's in the middle of their living room wall? But my print that I took on my EOS art, printed on a Pro 1000, that printer right there, and then sent to America. And this is why, for me, these stories are so important. Sharing these stories is so important. And why I love print so much, because there's, it's tactile, it's emotive. Um, no two screens are ever the same. All screens are different. But when you send somebody, and what I do is I make fine art, fine art archival prints, honey all of paper. Uh, they're in tissue paper. They have authentication certificates, and they're in a handmade wallet portfolio, which is made in Paris. None of this stuff is super expensive. And that's what Elle's daughter received. She opened that, that portfolio, unwrapped the, the paper, and that was her dad that she saw. Her dad that I'd had this incredible opportunity to photograph, and then to make the print, which was all personal. It was all me putting myself inside and inside of that piece of work and then sending it to them. And then this is probably for me one of the most exciting stories I can share because it's not about money. It's, uh, it's about emotion and it's about storytelling and it's about single image narrative and it's about people. Um, and, you know, I love it for all those reasons. If you want to know more about that story, again, I, I, was, I was so compelled to write after this I actually uh, wrote a story. It's not about Al, but it's about my childhood, a little bit I told you about there, and why that story is so important to me. And then if you want to know more, just clivebooth.com or at Clive Booth Photo. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed those three little journeys into visual storytelling. And um, I'm more than happy to answer anybody's questions if they've got any. They don't have to be photographic. They don't have to be print. They could just human interest questions, questions about the people, the places. Um, if you don't ask a question now, we can talk afterwards. Anybody got any questions right now? Anybody at all? Yes, yes sir. That's a really good question. So how smooth was my transition from graphic design to photography? Do you know what my biggest problem was, and still is, is lack of confidence. It, confidence is that word that uh, I struggle with. And I've had times in my career where I've, I've kind of managed to build the confidence to do things. And then by doing them, I've, I've felt the achievement of doing that and then gone on to do more things. Um, so when I was a graphic designer, when I came out of the mid-80s, in those days, you were a specialist. Nowadays, you can have multiple careers. But in those days, uh, particularly out of London, even within graphic design, you were either illustrative, you were photographic, you were typographic. So you were very much a specialist. So the thought of actually being a graphic designer and a photographer was totally unheard of. And it took me 20 years of being a graphic designer and commissioning other photographers uh, for me to finally bite the bullet. And in fact, it was a good friend of mine, uh, a very well-known American photographer called Doug Menuez, check him out, um, who I was working with him in San Francisco. He was working with Steve Jobs at the time in the mid-90s. And he's got an amazing exhibition called Fearless Genius and a book about his work with Jobs at Next Computer. And, um, and I, l I saw the work of Doug and I thought, do you know what, I'd love to have a go at this. And so I talked with Doug, and he, I was designing books for him back then, his photography books. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to do it. So 
I continued to be a graphic designer, and then I bought a, I think it was a, oh, what would it be, a, a D 850D or something? And I bought, a, I bought a 16 to 35 and a, and a 70 to 200, and then the big step was when I got an 85 Prime, and then I got a 5D. And then my clients started to commission me, or I would commission myself. But then my clients, more importantly, started to commission me, and that's when I started for shooting for Moa and Shandon at very lavish parties with Kate Moss and, and so on and so forth. So that's when it became like a big deal because that's when I got spotted and noticed. Because back then in the sort of mid-2000s, no one was shooting in low, light at low, in low light with fast primes. It was very unusual to see. And for every shot I got, I'd probably shoot 20. Um, and it was at that point when I started to build this portfolio, I thought, no, I'm going to do it. I'm going for it now. And then I, I still am a graphic designer. I'll never not be a graphic designer. You know, and I love typography, and I love composition, and I love light, and I love all those things. But yeah, I mean, it's funny because when you're at the other end, like I've worked for so many imp incredible clients like Aston Martin, Louis Vuitton, Mark Hennessy. I remember doing a project with Ernst & Young where I, I, I traveled the world. I remember sitting with the designer, and, and they're putting my pictures into their layout. And it was kind of like, I felt like I'm in the wrong chair. Uh, someone else had a question. Uh, uh, yes. Yes, it's a good question. So how much detail do you put into a shoot? How much work do you put in in terms of preparation? A lot is the answer, a lot of preparation. It's like uh, Anna asked me before tonight, said, oh, you do you feel nervous about tonight? And I said, I do feel nervous, but I also feel prepared. I've picked three of my favorite stories, which I couldn't wait to tell you. Um, and as long as the technology all works, which it has done, we're cool. Um, so the preparation is key, and whether it be the Birmingham Royal Ballet where you literally, you have one day to nail that shoot. And I, I have the most incredible team in a studio shoot. In fact, I often say, and I, I am not joking when I say this, I mean this, that I like to f feel like I'm the least talented person on a set. So I surround myself with very, very clever and talented people. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, when you pull people on a crew, it's because you get on with them. So you build a team that you really get on with, and it's fun, because if you can make it fun, like the lifeboat work, whenever there's an exercise and I go up, even though people are going to be ill, they still come out to go on that boat, because they know that they're going to be, you know, when they see that picture, uh, I think we've got it here, when they see a picture like this one, for example, you know, they can say, I was in that boat. I was in that boat, and then I make them the print, and then I send them the print, and that becomes incredibly special and unique to them. Uh, so preparation is, it's super important, you know, preparation, 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 um, concept, thinking, um, using Pinterest, all the crew knows what you're going to do, having a goal, having an objective. Um, in terms of location, it's about light, it's about, in, 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 uh, on the sea, it's about wind direction, water, all that stuff. Uh, there was one more question. We've got time for one more question? question online. Oh, online, yeah. What do yeah. you do when you feel unmotivated or don't have inspiration? That's a really, really, really good question. What do you do when you're not feeling motivated and you don't have inspiration? We all feel this, everybody. I'm sure if I asked to put your hands up, everybody here, particularly over the last, what, two, three years, I mean, has there been a more challenging time? My answer to that would be find a personal project that really sets you on fire inside. It could be anything that you can think of. Obviously, it needs to be something that you hope is achievable. I mean, if money isn't a problem, then travel. You know, now we can. But find that something that you feel passionately about, that you've got a unique connection with. And then go out and tell that story. Usually, if you've got the unique connection, like I have with the people of the Scots Scottish island, that's very, very important. And my work with the ballet, you know, to be able to be inside those worlds is really great because I can then shoot in those worlds and then bring that story out to a wider audience. And being able to share that story is great. For me, I love sharing stories like this in person. 
Um, or, okay, we've got the live stream as well. Uh, I'm, I'm probably less so at social media. Um, this I love, and it's great. It, you can probably tell how excited I am to be in front of people again after uh, so long of not being in front of people. But yeah, find something that really sparks your imagination and makes you feel, it gives you that motivation. And it doesn't feel like work. It mustn't feel like work. It must feel like something that you're driven towards doing. And that passion project, it's got to be a passion project. And by the way, the benefit of doing those passion projects, in my experience at least, is they nearly always turn into commercial work. There was one other question, I think. Yes. The conne connection with the client or the sitter in a portrait? With a client. Okay. I'm very lucky. I have an agent um, who is the sort of intermediary between me and the client. So in my agent is also the producer. Um, it's important that uh, you, you, know, you build a rapport with a client. But I'm in a, I, I don't know, you build a, like I know that your work, people will know your work because you have a particular look in your work. So people will buy, be buying you. And that's important. So if you can build a style, a tone of voice, like my work in Scotland, for exam example, got seen in Paris by Louis Vuitton Moat Hennessy, then I was commissioned. Because it was different, it was gritty, it was cloudy, it was everything that those pictures of that Scottish island were always sunny, bright days. I shot them like it was raining, it was cloudy, and that was all atmospheric. So atmosphere was very important. So that client came to me because they wanted that. So that's a big key thing because you're already on the same page then. So you're not getting a client who's actually asking you to shoot in a way that you don't want to shoot. And by doing that, you, you've already got a rapport. Um, yes, you do the absolute best. My, my attitude to working with clients is I will over-deliver on every job, every single job. We have one more from online. At the beginning, how did you find clients for your photography? Uh, they were my clients as a designer. So I actually started commissioning myself. Um, and that enabled me to start to build a portfolio um, but, I mean, the, the best example would be when I was working with Mo and Shannon as a graphic designer. So I was designing point of purchase um, champagne displays for Harrods and Selfridges. And I created this one-off uh, black taxi cab covered in Swarovski crystals um, with electroluminescent lights underneath it. And um, at the same time I was doing that, I was being invited to the parties and I would bring my 5D and my 85mm Prime. I'd be in a dinner jacket and I would just shoot pictures in the parties. And I was, I was at parties with Kate Moss and uh, gosh, I mean, all the big designers at the time. And so I would just shoot these pictures. And it was fascinating. It was at a fascinating world. And at the time, nobody had shot like that. So what I did was I kind of carved um, a niche for myself, but my years as a graphic designer had taught me to compose in probably slightly unusual ways. So I would crop in odd ways, and then I'd use my crop, I'd use light, and I'd use selective focus by using an 85 prime lens, always, always at 1.2, to create a look and feel. And a lot of it looked like Vermeer paintings. They actually looked like paintings, those, that initial work from way back when. Um, so I'd be working, for example, in the Raphael Gallery at London Fashion Week, and you'd have this incredible, beautiful uh, uh, subjects that you could photograph. And so uh, it was all around me. All I had to do was bring up my camera and compose and shoot and compose and shoot. And that's at the same time that Canon uh, first saw my work. And that's when, that's when Canon started to encourage me to work more with them, and they started to supply lenses and cameras to me. Anybody else got any questions? Yes. Yes, we do. Uh, yes, we do. All the time. All the time. And do you know when that happens? Is uh, when I'm on a shoot, I normally have assistants with me. And we did a shoot recently um, for the knitwear brand, John Smedley, which is a really beautiful brand. And uh, I had to pitch for that job, which I did a year ago. And um, I was very lucky I won the pitch. And um, 
um, I had a team with me that I actually built earlier this year through teaching. We were working on the Queen's Platinum Pageant with young people in schools. And this team are uh, uh, all local to me. And um, I had two of the guys are both photographers and they were helping with light and then a graphic designer with me. Uh, two of them are my friend's uh, son and daughter, George and Hannah, and Mark is another photographer. My answer to, my, to your question is that all the people I work with, you know I talk about them being so good, all the, the teams, the assistants I've worked with are all photographers in their own right. So when I'm looking here, they're over there, and then they're sort of looking at me and say, hey Clive, check this. There's a better picture from there than there is from here. So basically, everyone has uh, uh, an investment in the shoot. And so this is why I say, although I'm the person pressing the button, it's a big team effort. And even on the lifeboat, you know, you can have people saying, well, there's a much better angle over, on, over there. And they'll take me over there, and then that will, that will give me a better picture. So it's very much about collaboration. You know, we talked about preparation. Preparation being super important. Collaboration being really, really important as well. We can talk more uh, afterwards, but um, it's a huge pleasure for me uh, to be here tonight. Um, and I think we're going to do a workshop now, but thanks very much. Bye, everybody.